Good morning, and welcome to Asylum Hill Congregational Church, an open and affirming congregation in the United Church of Christ. Friends, we gather today to be reminded that no matter who we are or where we are on life's journey, each and every one of us is a unique part of this wild and crazy community we call church. Friends, whether you are live streaming with us for the first time this morning, or this has become your natural way of connecting with this community of faith, I say welcome. Welcome. I hope that you will feel both challenged and comforted in these times of worship. We'd love to know who you are. And the best way of doing that is by taking a quick moment to sign the virtual pew pad, which you can access through our church's website. And while you're on our website, you may wish to send in a prayer request as well. We gather your requests and pray for you and with you at the beginning of each and every week. So stay close. Stay connected, friends. I ask if you haven't already had the opportunity to do so, that you like us on Facebook, that you follow us on Instagram and on Twitter. Also, subscribe to our church's YouTube channel. We are archiving all of our virtual happenings there, including Sunday worship services. It's a great way to get church on demand, and it's a wonderful, easy way to be able to share links with your friends and family, those who you think might be inspired by a word. A couple of announcements for you this morning. I want to remind you of all of the happenings that are going on here at AHCC just today. First, following this morning's worship service at 11 a.m., we will be hosting an in-person parking lot worship service, which will be extremely family friendly. And actually, our third graders, our AHCC third graders, will be receiving their Bibles at that service. So whether you are young in age or young at heart, please join us for that service at 11 a.m. And then at 1 o'clock in our parking lot, we will be serving our weekly Sunday dinner, a free meal for all those who come to the table. Today's meal will be delicious ziti and meatballs prepared by Chef Andre with Delicacy, a local small business that has been a great partner. So come down if you'd like to help out or if you'd like to just pick up a meal to take home and enjoy for Sunday dinner. And then at 4 o'clock, there are two different offerings, both on Zoom. Different meeting IDs, of course, but both virtual conversations. There is first a gathering for those interested in AHCC's justice and outreach ministry opportunities. It'd be a time to catch up on all that has happened over the summer and all that we have planned coming up this program year. Also at four o'clock, I will be hosting another conversation related to stewardship and the current giving campaign that we are in the midst of. Some of you may not have even picked up on the fact that we are indeed, we are indeed in the midst of our giving campaign, our annual giving campaign. And so if you'd like more information on that, I'd like to talk about what giving means to you. Please join me at four o'clock. I know that these are two offerings happening at the same time, but you're gonna have to make, make a choice and I believe me, you can't go wrong with either. I also wanna let you know that there are just a few hours left to purchase something from our church merch shop. I will be honest, it took me some time to warm to the vintage logo that we decided on, but now I am absolutely in love. And in this season of making public statements about who we are, where we stand, and what we believe in, why not support AHCC and let the world know who you really are? 
a child of God, made in the image of love and delight. So take a look. Take a look this afternoon before it's too late and get your church merch. And last but not least, I want to just make an announcement about next Sunday. Next Sunday, we will be celebrating World Communion Sunday here at Asylum Hill Congregational Church. And to do that, we will be holding one worship service at 10.15 a.m. It will be an in-person service in our church parking lot, reminiscent of Homecoming Sunday just two weeks ago. We will be live streaming the service for those who are most comfortable with that medium. But again, next Sunday, one service, World Communion Sunday at 1015 in our parking lot. Friends, there are so many incredible spirit-infused opportunities for you to engage in, so many ways for you to connect as a community of faith, one with another. I have to implore you, however, especially in these times when things are shifting and changing so rapidly, please make sure you are one receiving this church's Friday email. And two, when you do receive that email, please make sure you are opening it and reading it thoroughly. It is the place where we are able on a weekly basis to connect with you, to let you know what's happening, and to also update you on any changes that may have occurred. But friends, let us now let us now bring our real and our authentic selves into the worship of our God. Let us join together in our responsive call to worship. Give ear, O oh my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. God, God will, will open God's, God's mouth, mouth in a parable, in a parable and utter sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide these things from our children. Rather, we will tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord. We will tell them of God's might and the wonders God has done. In the sight of our ancestors, the Lord worked marvels in the land of Egypt. God divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime, God led them with a cloud and all night long with a fiery light. The Lord split rocks open in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. Together, we worship and praise our God. of new dimensions in the face of changing ways who will lead the pilgrim peoples wandering in their separate ways god of rainbow fiery pillar leading where the eagles soar we your people ours the journey and despair who will lift the olive branches who will light the flame of care 
God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar. Be your people, ours the journey, now and ever, now and ever, now and evermore. Though we reach the highest heavens, holding worlds at our command. We are yet a desert people searching for the promised land. God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar. We, your people, ours the journey now and ever, now and ever, now and ever more. Should the threats of tire predictions cause us to withdraw in pain, may your blazing phoenix spirit resurrect the church again. God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar. We, your people, ours the journey, now and ever, now and ever, now and ever more. In 1993, the singer Prince changed his name to a symbol called a glyph. Since this symbol was impossible to pronounce, people began calling him the artist formerly known as Prince. Maybe you remember this. I was graduating high school that year. Well, friends, changes like this are never incredibly easy for us as human beings to wrap our brains around. Here at AHCC, due to some unforeseen challenges, the COVID-19 global pandemic topping the list, we too had to make some changes this year in what we are formerly calling our annual pledge campaign. Instead of kicking that off in the spring, in May, which has become our tradition, the Stewardship Committee, with the support of the Board of Deacons, decided to hold off on this annual campaign until the fall, until now. You may have received a letter, either by mail or in your inbox, but as a reminder, our giving goal this year at Asylum Hill Congregational Church is $1.1 million to support the vital and relevant ministries of this historic church. To date, you all have committed to give just over $300,000, which is a wonderful start and is approximately 20 7% of our goal. As I said, this is a wonderful start and it leaves plenty of room for you to participate. John, take it away. Good morning, Silent Hill Congregational Church. My name is John Bordell. I'd like to share with you a story, well, more of a parable. I met someone many years ago who was really, really handy. He was great with a hammer. If you needed something fixed or need something built, this was the guy that you wanted to call. He could help you build furniture. He could help you repair your house, just about anything. But over the years, every time I saw him, all he wanted to talk about was hammers, the history of hammers. He knew when the new models were coming out. When you went over to his house, he had stacks and stacks and stacks of hammers everywhere. 
His coffee table was littered with copies of Hammer Monthly magazine with back issues piled up in the corners. You could barely cross his living room because of all the Hammer display cases. And he wouldn't talk about anything but Hammers. Now, let's be honest. This guy sounds a little nutty, like maybe he needs some help with his Hammer hoarding problem. But let's try a little experiment. Take the word Hammer and substitute the word money. People who talk about money or experts in money or who pile up money for themselves are often, almost always, celebrated in our society. The hammer guy is nutty. The money guy gets on the cover of a magazine. Our society teaches us to glorify money, but there is help for us, and that help comes in the form once again of Jesus Christ. Our faith teaches us to glorify God and to give back to him what he's trusted us with, his trust, his patience, his love, and yes, the money. Jesus has a lot to say about money because it's been tripping people up for a long time. I'd like to encourage you to take a quick look at a Bible verse specifically for this occasion, Matthew 5, 42. In that verse, Jesus says, give to him who asks of you. So I'm asking of you to do something countercultural and exquisitely Christian. Make a pledge today to support the work of this church. It is a leap of faith to be sure, but if you lace up your shoes and check your spiritual conditioning, I know you can make it.
Friends, I'm standing here in our empty sanctuary, wiping away tears of joy. For that experience, to look at the faces of our choir members, to see and to hear them singing with such joy and love is overwhelming. It's also a wonderful reminder about the power, the connection that we have in the spirit, even across the miles, even in the distance that separates us physically. We have the power to connect in our love and in our belief in God. Let us connect again by bringing our hearts and our spirits into prayer. God, you are a God of compassion and a God of love. Time after time, we have experienced your care and your provision. Time after time, you've answered our prayers and met our needs often in ways we could never have dreamed possible. We praise you for your faithful love toward us. Because we have known your love, we come to you with confidence this hour, offering our prayers for the world that you created. God, today, this very day, we see so much pain and suffering, so much anger and frustration and despair. It is easy to feel overwhelmed by the needs around us. But we continue to bring our prayers, our prayers to you in faith, because we know that nothing is impossible for you. You are the God who rained down bread from heaven and made water flow from a rock in the desert. The God who resurrected Jesus from the dead and who brings new life and hope to all who believe. Truly for you, all things are possible. This morning, we lift prayers for those suffering the effects of recent natural disasters, fires consuming the natural world and the homes and lives of your beloveds, waters and winds tearing apart the fabric of coastal communities, drought drying up our land. Because nothing is impossible for you, O oh God, hear our prayer and in your love, answer. We pray for the regions of our world caught up in violence and threats of violence, for American cities on the brink, for regions of Asia where leaders lust for power, for the Middle East where peace is always being called into question because nothing is impossible for you, O oh God. Hear our prayer and in your love, answer. We pray for those who live with serious illness, those with chronic pain, those without access to proper medical care, those for whom treatment is no longer an option. We pray for those families, for those communities who have lost loved ones, for those grieving the more than 200,000 deaths in our nation alone from COVID-19, because nothing is impossible with you. Oh God, hear our prayer and in your love, answer. Merciful God, 
You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to show us a different way to live, the way of deep humility and obedience. You've called us to love one another and to work together with one heart and mind, balancing our needs with the needs of those around us. Give us courage today to follow faithfully and with integrity with actions that bear witness to the words we speak and worship that overflows into our daily tasks and relationships so that our lives will bring glory and honor to you, our Redeemer and Lord. And now, O oh God, hear the prayer we pray as one, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, this would be a wonderful time if you would like to think about and to act, to act in the ways of giving of your abundance of the good and gracious and loving gifts that God has bestilled upon your life. So as we receive this wonderful gift of music, let us also give of our gifts. God, receive now the gifts that we give so that these gifts may go out into the world, proclaiming your love, your grace, and your mercy for all your children. It is the name, in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. A reading from 
the 17th chapter of the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 7. Listen now for a word from the Lord. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and they complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing up in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and the water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of questioning and quarreling children, be with us now. Open our hearts, our eyes and our ears so that we might hear and see and sense you this day. Amen. So I cannot tell you how many times I have opened my refrigerator, looked in at the contents, and come to the conclusion there's nothing to eat in this house. Anyone else? Please tell me I am not alone with this. So what's happening when this takes place? Is there really no food in the fridge? Should I immediately head out the door to my local market and stock up on staples? Or is something else going on? Well, in my particular case, I confess that a literal empty fridge has never been my reality. Rather, I believe what's happening when this claim is made is that there is a lack of creativity in what could be done or made with what is actually on those shelves. You see, it's, it's looking at the individual items, vegetables, condiments, milk, cheese, yogurt, hot dogs, pickles, you fill in the blank, and seeing each with a singular purpose. What's not happening is the creative work of imagining. What can I do with these things? What can I combine? What can I chop, shred, juice, blanch, poach, cook, bake to create a feast? Friends, we can do this with scripture as well. How many of you have listened to a reading or opened your Bible to read something yourself and have ended up thinking, I'm just not sure there's anything here for me. Anna Carter Florence, a seminary preaching uh, professor and an ordained PCUSA minister, in her book, Rehearsing Scripture, Discovering God's Word in Community, advocates for a variety of approaches when engaging the word. 
One approach that I have become increasingly drawn to is her idea of reading the verbs. That's what she calls it. Carter Florence argues that the parts of scripture on which we often focus the nouns, people, places, and things, the items, the individual items in the fridge, if you will, almost immediately allow the reader to distance themselves from the text, often without even being conscious of this. What this looks like is a reader, you and I, can usually easily note that I am not a Samaritan. I have never lived in Egypt. I have never owned a vineyard. Verbs, on the other hand, are common across time and space and do not allow such distancing, at least not quite as easily. In an interview, when asked about teaching this approach to her students, Dr. Carter Florence said, nouns are what you go to seminary to learn. It's what everybody needs to look up. How do you say this? Where was that? What's this? They are these fascinating remnants of that galaxy far, far away. She added in this interview, but I found that my students were getting far too distracted by the nouns. So it was hard for us to have any kind of conversation. So one day I said, okay, we're going to read the verbs first. And I want you to talk about them and question them. We'll get to the nouns later. Carter Florence was shocked at how this seemingly simple shift began to open up her students' relationship to the text. They were no longer just studying it. They were experiencing it. Finally, they tapped into the creative action of God throughout time and space and history, and the story became their own. So friends, what if we... What if we were to open up the refrigerator today and take a look at what nouns the 17th chapter of Exodus had to offer? This is what we would find, a desert located in modern-day Saudi Arabia, a campground at a place called Rephidim, which in Hebrew means a place of rest, We'd find Moses worried. We'd find a whole lot of Israelites of differing ages, all with disagreeable faces. There would be dozens of empty water bottles and parched livestock all over the place. There would be also a staff and a stone broken into two pieces with water coming out. And I would be the first to admit When I am only concerned with the nouns of this story, I am apt to close the refrigerator door on Exodus 17 and once again say there's not a whole lot for me to eat. I'm just not really sure how this ancient story about people I don't know, about a place I've never been to and an experience I've never had makes a whole lot of sense to me or adds value to my life. But what if we looked again? And this time we used Carter Florence's technique of reading the verbs. Here's what the passage sounds like. Journeying. Quarreling. Questioning. Testing. Thirsting complaining, crying out, striking, standing up. And all of the sudden, the energy of the movement and of the action in this text comes alive in entirely new and dynamic ways. Can you feel that? I mean, who among us is not on a journey. 
You know what that's like be it a physical journey. I think about all of the students who have headed back to schools and universities this month, or be it an inner journey, a mental, emotional, or spiritual one. The process is never a straight line. We don't go from point A to point B without lots of twists and turns and sometimes even seasons that seem like we are just wandering with no sense of where we might end up. Or how about quarreling? Any of you familiar with a good fight? I won't name names, but I do know there are a few of you out there today who are pretty good at digging in your heels and throwing up your proverbial dukes. I mean, our nation is mired in quarreling these days. Governing has all but come to a halt because leaders have become singularly focused on staying in power rather than empowering those whom they have vowed to serve. Quarreling, it's all around us. Any of you out there questioning this morning? I mean, I'll be the first to admit today that I have a lot of questions for God right now. Starting with God, how have we come this far? Struggled this long, endured this much, only to be struck down, me and my children, as we thirst for justice and righteousness. But more than my questions, what are yours? What are you questioning? When you pray, what do you find yourself asking for? What are you talking to God about these days? Then there's testing, which can come in a myriad of ways. And I would say the COVID-19 pandemic is one of the biggest tests that many of us alive today has had to undergo. The virus is testing our patience, our endurance, our resolve. It's testing our capacity to look beyond ourselves and to care for and take care of one another's health and well being. And it's testing our collective ability to tell the truth and believe the science. Or how about thirsting? Any of you find yourselves extremely thirsty these days? And I don't mean for spirits or coffee or even for water. Rather, what are you longing for deep inside? Do you yearn for an intimate relationship or to start a family? Do you wish you could get on a plane and fly to visit and connect with a loved one you haven't seen in many months? Do you desire to be heard or seen or accepted for who you are in the fullness of your God-given humanity? Because, friends, if your body is not literally aching for another way right now, I need you to check your pulse. Uh, and then there's complaining, my favorite verb ever. All I'm going to say about this is I take great comfort in knowing that even Jesus was subject to intense complaining from those who knew him best and loved him most. Given the reckoning on race our nation is undergoing right now, I think it is impossible to separate out from one another the last three verbs from Exodus chapter 17, which are crying out, striking, and standing up. The evidence of these actions is everywhere right now. People are crying out. We hear it. I can't breathe say their names. Please tell me that the lives of our black and brown sons and daughters, 
matter as much as the lives of our white sons and daughters. And people are indeed striking the rocks of injustice in the streets and in the courts and with the power of their vote hitting where it hurts most. Now let me be absolutely clear. I do not condone violence, be it from individuals or groups of paramilitary vigilantes or organizations aligned on either the right or the left. Rioting, looting, and the burning down of our cities is not the answer to what plagues us. And at the same time, I do understand what Martin Luther King Jr. was saying when he said rioting is the voice of the unheard. I can hold my condemnation of violence alongside my compassion for those who rage against injustice. Neither is mutually exclusive. And then there are those in our nation who are standing up, millions of people actually across the world, saying enough is enough. The hate, the greed, the corruption, the lies, the exploitation, people's drunken obsession with power, there has to be a better way. We cannot continue to treat God's creation, God's people, as if this life is meaningless. Beloveds, in fact, I would argue that this moment in time, the year 2020, might be the year that we stop fixating on the nouns and begin embracing the verbs of life. If verb is an action, a movement, 2020 might actually be the year that we look back at and recognize that it isn't the institutions or organizations that are leading the way, rather it's the movements, the people, the body of Christ alive in the world. This might just be the year that the ancient story of the Israelites journey through the desert, thirsting for the very thing that gives and sustains life, becomes our own. The nouns, or the verbs, which one will we decide is most important? A year ago today, I was in Guayaquil, Ecuador for a women's health symposium, the first of its kind in the community of Guasmo Sur, an underserved barrio on the south side of that city. I took my youngest daughter with me so that we could spend time bonding and so that she could reunite with a friend of hers for a couple of days. You, you see, over the years, she has become quite close to a girl about her age, Nayeli. Now I have known Nayeli's mother and grandmother for over two decades and so it warms my heart every time these two little girls are able to be in one another's physical presence. There are always big hugs and lots of giggles and it's a reminder of not only the continuation of life but of what is most important, human relationships and the love we shower upon one another. Well, on the second, night, uh, or second or third night of our trip, I asked Nayeli if she would like to have a sleepover at our house. The squeals from both girls was all I needed to know that the idea was definitely a hit. That night, I listened to them as they ate popcorn and watched their favorite Disney movie singing along in both Spanish and English, cuddled up to one another like sisters. And I remember 
thinking that evening. These two girls have such different stories, such different life experiences. Their nouns exist in stark contrast to one another. Yet they act, they act, their ways of being in the world are so similar. Their verbs, if you will, dance together in almost perfect harmony. Beloveds, the particulars of each and every one of our stories will always be different. But the emotions, the ways we feel, move, and act are universal and timeless. I think it's what God was saying with the divine mandate to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly. God was proclaiming and expecting this from God's people thousands of years ago, and God proclaims and expects the same from you and I living in 2020 as well. Beloveds, I hope that the next time you go to open your refrigerator or your Bible, you will be amazed by the possibilities God has set out before you. Go, get creative, and as Christians, let us stand up and act our creed. Amen. and act your creed let your prayer be in your deed seek the right perform the true raise your work and life on you hearts around you sing with care you can help them And bring inspiring light, arm their faltering wills to fight. Let your arms be hope and joy, and your worship God's employ, giving thanks in humble zeal, leaning all God's will. love bereft of fear, born in heaven and radiant here. Beloveds, I, you, we, are more than our pronouns. We are more than just our names. We are more than our certificates our degrees, our titles. We are more than the numbers on our scales, in our bank accounts, or our zip codes. We are more than our medals and our trophies and the plaques that hang upon our walls. We are more than our greatest success and more than our biggest failure. We are God's creative power. We are, each and every one of us, vine masterpiece. May we go out into the world today acting as such. Blessings be upon you all in the name of God, our creator, Jesus Christ, our savior, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, go 
in peace. Amen. Thank you.